Our next speaker is Ross Cooper. Ross used to work as an aquarist at the Aquarium of the Pacific, where he worked hands-on with tropical sharks, rays, and many other kinds of marine fish. He wanted to expand his career more into the fishery science and management side of the field. So he came to Scripps to help pursue that career. To that end, he has worked alongside fisheries research scientists at NOAA at the Southwest Fishery Science Center to study fishery data involving highly migratory species. species. He also joined the R Club, which <laughs> if, it's pretty nerdy, if, if, for those of you who don't know what it is. But it's what you do if you want to be a fishery scientist. Um, around here in this year's cohort, he is Mr. Opa, the king of Opa. Um, and just, in fact, last weekend, he procured a beautiful spotted opa. You'll see pictures of what this fish looks like. But for the whole cohort and then some and friends and families to come and enjoy during a really incredible, special sort of afternoon picnic here at Scripps. And it's been really fantastic having him on board. Um, we all love opa now. We didn't know that we did. So... His project is called The Fish Formerly Known as Lampras Gutatus, Analyzing Combined Catch Per Unit Effort of Two Recently Defined Species of Opa. When somebody says Opa to you, <laughs> It can mean a couple of different things depending on the culture. So in Greek, it's kind of a call to kick off the dancing and the partying. In Korean, it's a term of endearment that a younger sister will call her older brother. And in German, it's a term for a grandfather. So either with these cultural perspectives or simply as an exclamation, the word carries with it a sense of joy and reverence and celebration. So when I found out that there was a bright orange and silver fish called an opa, I figured there had to be something special that would stand out about it. And sure enough, these were considered good luck charms when they were caught by uh, fishermen traditionally in Hawaii and the South Pacific and then gifted to their friends and family. Uh, furthermore, biologically they're pretty interesting. Opa do not swim with their tail fins like other fish do. Instead, they use their pectoral fins on the sides of their body to flat very rapidly. <laughs> that motion not only generates a lot of heat within their body, but they're able to retain that heat and distribute it throughout the rest of their body, which effectively makes them the only full-bodied endothermic or warm-blooded fish, which gives them a pretty significant advantage when they're uh, foraging for prey in the kind of cold and deep environments that they tend to inhabit. These are some great photos because they give you an idea of the scale of these fish. They get to be about five feet long, but also you can see just how hard these guys are working to hoist these fish up. I don't blame them. A uh, full-grown opa can reach upwards of around 200 pounds. These are pretty large fish. So here in the North Pacific, when opa are caught, they're just listed as one species, Lampras cutatus. Uh, but over time, fishermen and scientists started to notice some differences. Well, some had darker fins, some had different kind of spots on them, and some just had different sized eyes. So they performed some testing, and sure enough, those tests confirmed the presence of two genetically distinct species here in the North Pacific, the Big Eye Pacific opa and the Small Eye Pacific opa. Those tests were also able to kind of give us some rough estimates of where these fish are found. Most of the big eye are found closer towards Hawaii, whereas most of the small eye are found closer towards the west coast of the United States with the 150 degree west meridian uh, out in the ocean, kind of serving as a rough boundary between those two. So despite this new information, there's still a lot that we do not know about OPA populations. They're not a directed fishery, and as such, they're not included in fishery management plans. Uh, so it's important that we study these fish to make sure that if we're fishing for them, we're doing so sustainably, and so we can understand more about them. And that's where my project came in. So my main objective was to study patterns of OPA being fished here in the North Pacific. I wanted to study the effort that was being put out trying to catch OPA, how much OPA was being caught, and then based on that, I could calculate the catch per unit effort, or CPUE. And that's a really useful metric in fishery science because it's kind of a rough estimate of uh, populations in the wild. So to do this, I wanted to go and visualize the catch, how much it was being caught, the effort, or the number of sets that were being put out that wind up catching OPA, and then uh, take that catch per effort that I can calculate and visualize that spatially. So to see where the significant geographic areas are in the North Pacific, but I also had to look at the overarching patterns of the whole region of fishery over time or temporally 
Because this fishery has changed quite a bit in the last 23 years, the range, the number of effort, the number of fishing vessels has all fluctuated. And so it's not static. It's important that we're looking at these uh, trends over time. It's also important to consider the seasonality of this fishery. I wanted to see if opo were being caught in different patterns in different kinds of the year. And furthermore, I wanted to see if there were any patterns that we could discern by looking at the two different areas dominated by the different species. So to analyze this data, I used Pelagic Longline Fisheries logbook data. Now this was provided to me by the Pacific Island Fisheries Science Center out in Hawaii. And this data set spanned from 1996 to 2018, so we had about 23 years of data to work with. So these fishery, this fishery is operating around the Hawaiian Islands and also out towards, uh, more in the ocean, towards the continental North America. It was a ton of data, and I had to only focus on parts of it. So I subsetted this data to only include the deep set gear. Now this is primarily targeting big eye tuna at around 400 meters deep, but it's also catching significant amounts of OPA, which is why I used it for this project. And I had to go through the original data set and filter it pretty extensively to remove any errors or outliers or omissions to make sure that the data was not only accurate, but also relevant to the project itself. Then I took that data and I wanted to summarize it spatially. Um, Essentially what that means is I took the number of sets, the catch, and that catch per effort, and I summarized it into five degree by five degree spatial blocks. And once I had those blocks, I could then create a grid that spanned over the fishery range. This was useful not only because it created this spatial summary of what we were looking at, but also by law, we're actually required to not, we can't just show the individual fishing data points. Uh, to satisfy the confidentiality agreements, each block has to have at least three fishing vessels in it per that grid at that given time. If not, we have to get rid of it. So now I'll take you through some of these data visualizations. Uh, they, these are going to be showing that fishery expansion from 1996 onwards, so we can look for any emerging patterns. Uh, so again, each of these blocks that are visualized on the maps here are a uh, summary of that spatial data contained within that range for that given year. So for all of these, this is just data from 1996. The next slide will be 1997 and so forward. Uh, and we have three visualizations on here. So on the left, in this map here, this is showing the number of sets or the effort. And as those blocks get darker black, that indicates that there is a higher amount of effort within that grid. In the middle, that is showing the catch. So as those get darker purple, that indicates that more, uh, more OPA are being landed in that specific spot. And then based on those two, we can calculate the catch per unit effort. And as that gets darker red, that is showing higher CPUE. Any area that is listed in green is an area that long line fishing is prohibited. So as we start to go through each of these years, there's not a lot of patterns that will jump out right away. You can see the fishery itself is starting to expand further and further out. And on the kind of extent, the new frontier of the fishery, you're noticing there'll be kind of less effort happening in those areas. What tends to happen, if you look at the effort area here, most of the effort is staying centered right around Hawaii, almost uh, exclusively around the islands, although it uh, declines or decreases the further we extend out from Hawaii. Now, 2006 is an interesting year. Uh, this was the year they established the Papahanaumokuakea National Marine Monument, which, yeah, I know, right? Uh, <laughs> And that significantly increased the amount of uh, restrictions uh, geographically on longline fishing, particularly in that uh, western extent of the fishery. So some of the trends you'll notice continuing, that effort is still staying right around Hawaii, but the fishery is continuing to extend closer and closer towards the mainland. As it does so, again, that effort kind of out here on the edge is going to consistently be fairly low. But despite that, if we're looking at the catch, and the catch per effort, on that same kind of frontier as we move closer towards the west coast, that is where we're seeing much higher amounts of OPA catch and also OPA catch per unit effort. And this trend seems to hold pretty true until we get into the last year of the time series, last year 2018, which actually does a great job of summarizing all those patterns. Despite the fishery expanding pretty extensively east, away from Hawaii, most of the effort stays right around here. There's not that much effort that's being uh, put out over there. That's where most of the OPA catch happens to be. And as a result, we get this 
real gradient that is in, of CPUE that increases the further we get away from Hawaii and towards the mainland. Now again, it's important that we look at these years, year by year, to see how they've changed and uh, how the fishery expands, because as the fishery moves, that is going to affect how we view, view each year individually. But it's also important to look at the seasonality of this. So this, this, is, a, this is how I visual, or tried to visualize some of the seasonality that is happening in these regions. So this is data from 2014 to 2018. Each of the, year, the months from those years are here on the x-axis. And on the y-axis, we have the average monthly catch per unit effort. So I also wanted to split this into the two different regions of the fishery, the east and the west, um, again, separated by that 150 degree west meridian. Uh, the east section, closer towards uh, continental United States, is represented in red. And uh, blue is the western section of that fishery, uh, closer to Hawaii. So if you look at just the east section, the cash per unit effort is, is much higher than the west across the board, which we kind of already saw from that last graph. But it's very variable. It's kind of all over the place. We don't really see any seasonal trends based on just the east section. And that's due to the fact that the fishery was moving around. It was changing over time, at different amounts of effort in different years. Whereas in the west, yes, it's lower CPU, but we, it does exhibit a lot more seasonal patterns. We see that there's kind of peaks in these summer months every year. And if I overlay these green bars that are showing uh, the peak landing months for Big Eye Tuna, which is the primary target of this fishery, we can see that the CPUE for OPA is spiking in these, in these gaps in the off season here. Now it's hard to make any significant statements based on that because this is all fishery dependent data. It's hard to say if this is biological influences or fishery influences, but either way, the fact that we can see some trends here gives us a nice jumping off point to continue with some other research. So to kind of reiterate some of the points that I saw and I found looking through this data, not only is catch per unit effort CPUE highest in the northeast extent of the fishery range over here, but there's this real obvious gradient that increases as we move towards the northeast. Now this is not species specific data, this is all just lumped OPA data combined, but if we apply what we know about that 150 degree west meridian serving as that rough potential border between the two, the area that's considered dominated by Big Eye Opa has much lower CPUE. And it doesn't really have a regional peak. There is a little, there is a box up here that is the highest in that region, but it's really just part of the gradient that is increasing towards the east. So fortunately, um, I do have some funding this summer to continue working with the Sussman Foundation to study some of this. Uh, we want to continue the, well, Remember the fact that there's a lot more, less stability in that east section. We want to study some of the environmental factors in that area. And also we want to compare this whole area um, to some other fisheries operating in the same region, such as the, south, the shallow set longline fishery. And so I get it, that this kind of OPA is not really as exciting as the other kinds of OPA I was talking about earlier. <laughs> but I think it's really exciting that there is a lot of there's, some, there's evidence that there is something going on here, and there is definitely some evidence that we need to continue researching this, particularly if we're going to be fishing these fish without an existing fishery management plan. So with that said, I'd like to thank my committee, Heidi Dewar, Steve Teo, and Heidi Batchelor. You guys have been so great to work with. Um, Oriana Poindexter has been a huge help, and also my PhD, me my PhD mentor, Kayla. I know she's somewhere up there. She's been so awesome helping me out all year, um, and also, Everyone already said it, but you guys, of course, too. So, uh, thanks. Yeah. And I'm happy to take questions. So, are these are, are the fishermen based in Hawaii or in California? And, and what's their effort to go? It's kind of tricky. So most of the most of the permitted vessels here are based out of Hawaii. There are very few that are based out of California. That said, a lot of them are landing the fish here in San Diego, actually. So it's it's kind of confusing that it's a Hawaiian vessel landing the fish here too. But uh, they also land them in Hawaii. It really depends on the time of year in which they will be landing their their catch. So it does fluctuate throughout the year. Um, but 
again, most of the effort it really is centered around Hawaii. So that is where most of the, the fishing for this fishery is happening. It just happens that opa are being caught further out.